So we have a couple of questions here. Um, like I said, for the presenters, um, if you guys could think of potential questions to ask each other, that would be great. The general question was any application examples that could use BEC? Yeah, so the, the way I came to presenting eventual consistency along with Heidi was uh, coming from collaboration software. So um, I, I work on sort of Google Docs style collaboration software where several people can work on a document at the same time. And one question that came up there is, well, even if we have several uh, several people who are who don't mutually trust each other working on the same document, can we ensure that nevertheless all of the collaborators uh, will converge to the same state? And we realized that yes, we can do that and we don't require any consensus to do that. Collaboration is where I came from, but I think it uh, the set of apps that, c that you can implement with BEC is much broader. So I would say all sorts of social networking and messaging apps uh, where, you know, you have several people contributing to some kind of discussion thread or some kind of structure or liking updates or posting stuff and so on. You know, all of those things uh, should be invariant confluent. There, there's no particular constraints that need to be uphold, upheld there other than basic permissions, but like uh, like access permissions are, are fine under BEC as well. Also, there's a whole class of sort of enterprise apps. Um, so the types of systems that companies will use maybe internally or maybe for co coordination with suppliers or clients, uh, you know, customer relationship management, enterprise resource uh, planning, all that sort of stuff, um, recruitment systems and so on. All of those are at the moment implemented with a centralized database. Um, and I believe most of those would also be amenable to BEC. So they don't really have um, any invariants that would that are not confluent, as far as I can tell, apart from sort of like, you know, there's basic stuff like um, uniqueness of primary keys and stuff like that. You can easily get around that by using hashes as primary keys, for example. So then um, the, the need to maintain uniqueness through some kind of constraint goes away. A question for, for Martin, maybe you said it, but I, I missed it. Uh, so I, I'm actually not entirely sure what you mean by Byzantine eventual consistency, do you? have a, a definition for that? Yes, yeah, so I tried to put a, a definition in the talk. It's, it's defined in terms of five or six properties. Uh, so what one property is the liveness property that I talked about, which is that an eventual that an update is eventually received by all non crashed clients. Um, there's a convergence so that any two clients or any two nodes that have received the same set of updates will converge to the same state. Uh, and then this preservation of invariance. Um, and then there are a few more technical uh, updates where we actually have a causality same. property in there as well. Um, so we, you can ensure a cause, causally ordered uh, broadcast, essentially. Right. So, so it's, it's similar to eventual consistency, which actually, frankly, I never really completely understood the <laughs> definition of either. But that, so, but, so this then applies to the Byzantine notes or sorry, sorry, the non-Byzantine notes, the correct notes? Or... Yes, because we, we can't make any statement about the, what the Byzantine nodes are going to do. So we, yeah, but, but we good, can't say what their state is. Yeah. Um, so all we can do is make statements about what the correct nodes uh, do in the but, presence of arbitrarily many uh, Byzantine nodes. Byzantine nodes could still um, like propose values that could get accepted by the correct nodes. It's, there's also not much you can do about that, I guess. <laughs> exactly. So Byzantine nodes can generate updates like anybody else because you don't know if a node is Byzantine 40. So Okay. And and, th and those those updates will propagate um, through the network just like any other update. The key thing we want to ensure is that, uh, for example, if a Byzantine node is Eve is syncing with Alice and Eve is syncing with Bob, Eve Eve is uh, Byzantine and Alice and Bob are honest. Eve should not be able to make Alice and Bob inconsistent with each other. So um, so uh, the. Byzantine nodes should not be able to somehow mess up the state of the of the honest nodes. So what makes a good witness? And then also, are there any results with regard to battery life impact on the Android prototype? I mean, so yeah, what makes a good witness? I and mean, this, this is a tricky question. Uh, so I guess it depends a lot on the application and each witness brings a certain amount of trust in that that block is gonna be maintained. 
And uh, now witnesses may be independent of one another. If those witnesses are in the, independent of one, one another, you can simply add the, the, the various levels of trust and you get the total amount of trust. If they are, however, suffer from dependent failures, uh, maybe they collude if they're, they're malicious, then uh, you know, that, that, that computation is, is, is not so simple. So um, one thing that we've, we've been experimenting with is like uh, the, the notion of you know, like sort of real life witnesses, like what, what, what makes a real life witness? Well, the, 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 uh, a person has to be in the same place at the same time as the event that's being witnessed. Uh, so if the events like in a, in a digital farm situation, say uh, in, in involve sensor readings, maybe they're simply nearby sensors. Of course, they have also then more likelihood of be having dependent failures. Um, something that, you know, another thing we're looking at is, is uh, that's maybe orthogonal is, is using um, secure uh, trusted execution environments like uh, ARM Trust Zone, which we've experimented with but haven't integrated into the vector pr prototype yet. Um, we have done pretty uh, extensive measurements of uh, battery life on um, uh, in, with our protocols and it's in the in the paper draft that we have. There are various graphs that, uh, well, at least one it that I know of that deals with uh, you know like the drain on the battery uh, for the protocols that we use. Um, we compare it a little bit with you know sort of other kinds of. Uh, more traditional blockchain algorithms, but uh, you know, it's 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 it could be argued that that's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Uh, but we have we have those graphs, you know, yeah, you know, like the 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 longer the transmission range, uh, the more you reconcile, the more updates there are, you know, that all all that costs uh, power. A lot of it, the Joe, is negligible compared to the amount of power that your screen on that device draws. So uh, it's it, it might be much cheaper than having your screen on. Patrick, how does your analysis compare to the Gray, Kiyas, and Leonardo's, I think I'm pronouncing this probably wrong, Bitcoin backbone, and then he linked the paper. Um, and then Marco proceeds to say, they say regarding BA, we observe that Nakamoto's suggestion falls short of solving it. Um, Patrick, I know you say it's been a while since you've read their argument, but would, would you mind expanding upon a little bit what you wrote in the chat? Basically, that paper was the, the as far as I know, the first one to give a very convincing model of here's what Bitcoin is doing. Um, and that was very good. And that's a 2014 paper. My concern with this paper is that, as, as uh, Marco said, uh, it doesn't actually, uh, it, it says that Bitcoin is not solving BA, but then uh, it kind of is almost solving BA. Um, my concern is that this is not the turn we should be taking. Um, actually, uh, we should, if we want to keep the nice properties that uh, blockchain that Bitcoin offers, and we don't, <laughs> I would argue we don't exactly what, know what those are, but these are very desired in today's world, as is evidenced by uh, how things are. Um, we should be going in the other direction uh, and actively, actively try not to be accidentally solving uh, atomic broadcast because that comes with a bag of technical uh, theoretical problems. Uh, and one thing that um, disturbs me in the paper is that they're actually doing the opposite even a step further because they then implement uh, an atomic broadcast com uh, algorithm using their protocol, their model of the Bitcoin protocol. About the witnesses, I didn't quite catch the purpose um, that they served. Was it to make sure that a uh, an update that is being added to the system cannot be removed again, or something like that? That's a good, that's exactly the purpose of a witness. Yeah. So each each witness brings you a little extra guarantee that the up the update won't disappear uh, and. It's an you know application question. Then, how much is enough? Uh, and which is not completely dissimilar from you know like one if, the finalization question in the in Bitcoin, right? You know how how many blocks does another block to be buried under uh, before you you trust it? Um, so we leave that as an application specific issue. Although I think it's actually a pretty interesting issue. In, in general, and I, uh, I, I don't actually have a, a great answer to 
what makes a, a good witness, but we have some ideas. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for all of our presenters today um, for this session that wraps it up.